of liberty. Well, first, I really want to thank you for uh, last night. That was uh, uh, the very nicest uh, public thing that has ever happened to me. And it was particularly nice because it was, uh, it seemed like uh, a bunch of friends uh, just doing something very friendly. And I think that's very nice for libertarians. It's much better than honors. I think there's something inherently uh, unlibertarian about honoring people, but I think there's uh, something wonderfully warm about just uh, uh, being neighborly with <laughs> them. I really liked it very much. I discovered that, uh, that Mary Margaret and uh, Jan and uh, Therese, my wife, had plotted a lot of this <laughs> for some time. I'm, I'm used to Jan and my wife <coughs> plotting things together because they they constitute a small conspiracy against my <laughs> my more outrageous activities. Uh, but now that Mary Margaret's joined it, they'll they'll get organized. <laughs> <laughs> and the, uh, Therese and Jan, if they ever did get organized, would be dangerous. <laughs> so <laughs> I look forward to more tumultuous times. But that was really really very wonderful. I, I, I'm deeply moved by it. I'm very appreciative. Well, so about skills, uh, <clears throat> because this is Sunday, we should certainly have a reading from Scripture. <laughs> and uh, so if you will turn to uh, the notebooks of Lazarus Long, <laughs> I will read uh, the good Saint uh, Robert's definition of skills. A human being should be able to change a diaper, plan an invasion, butcher a hog, con a ship, design a building, write a sonnet, balance accounts, build a wall, set a bone, comfort the dying, take orders, give orders, cooperate, act alone, solve equations, analyze a new problem, pitch manure, program a computer, cook a tasty meal, fight efficiently, die gallantly. Specialization is for insects. <laughs> and <laughs> I, um, I get a, a lot of my initial problems with uh, libertarian theory, I believe, began with a rather cavalier disregard I've often had for the division of labor. And uh, this early on tagged me as a malcontent and probably a communist. But the uh, the point about it, as I've always explained, is that I understand that the division of labor is efficient and obviously necessary. It's just that it's irritating. Uh, I would like to be able to do everything uh, myself, but I understand that there are limits to this. And so I accede uh, grumblingly to the division of labor. I have nothing ideologically uh, to oppose about it. It's just that it's, a, it's an aesthetic thing. Uh, that it would be very nice to build, a, be very nice to build your own spacecraft and sail it uh, out to the asteroids. But I, I suspect it would be better to, to work with some other people. And now that I can't, <laughs> now that I can't lift uh, too many heavy things, because I'm now bionic, I have a, a wonderful little metallic aortic valve that is obviously better than the original equipment. I've discussed with various surgeons replacing other defective parts, <laughs> but they don't think that this is, uh, this is tampering with nature, they say. And I, I, I'm a great advocate of tampering with nature because nature, being slow and uh, stodgy, I can't quite keep up to the, uh, the quick demands of the human physiology. But at any rate, uh, since I can't lift too, too very much, I've understood that the division of labor is, uh, is important. Fortunately, Therese, beside being the most intelligent human being I've ever met, is uh, fairly strong. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you know, that's an odd thing. When, when you go places, 
and uh, she is uh, observed toting a 50-pound sack of uh, dog food or something, and I'm walking along with the package which has nothing but, say, uh, Modess in it. <laughs> you, you have to overcome that, that initial <laughs> feeling that everybody uh, will scorn you for it, but I'm over it now, and uh, they're, they're wonderful. When you can't lift very heavy things yourself, you begin to study levers more. And thus necessity uh, makes tool users out of all of us, and you learn from every infirmity, I believe. And so I guess the greatest skill of all is simply to, uh, to understand that you can learn anything and do anything. Now, the, Thoreau was brought up last night. And I've already, I've, I've always been a Thoreauian softy. I just think that uh, He's altogether excellent, and recently I read an intellectual history of Thoreau, and I was, I was bowled over to discover that one of Thoreau's great uh, 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 enthusiasms was for Adam Smith, and that as a matter of fact, the whole first chapter uh, of Walden, which is on domestic economy, was written as a application of Adam Smith's uh, uh, work which, uh, about which Thoreau was terribly enthusiastic, an application of that to the individual. Now, Thoreau was very much annoyed by uh, uh, the division of labor. He said in, in one point that his concept of a perfect project was one of which he could be sole captain and perform uh, by himself. In other words, he was the most raging uh, capitalist individualist in, in that sense. He was a... Uh, uh, he was a careful, fairly careful scientist, although not credentialed in that at all. And for instance, uh, it was so good that he, he waged a, a considerable intellectual battle with uh, Louis Agassiz, who was a, uh, a great and famous uh, scientist. Uh, Agassiz took a, a, a view of sort of scientific creationism, and Thoreau uh, d defended as a scientist. Uh, a more Darwinian approach uh, to, uh, to animal species. So he was a very serious person, that, and I think that's, a, that's something that's to be borne in mind. I, I remember that during the, uh, the late lamented 60s that uh, people were into things. And I remember a woman who lived in a house with us at one time who said that she was into photography and asked to borrow a camera and her first question after borrowing it, borrowing it was, how do you load it? And so I concluded that being into something meant having an opinion about something. The opinion being that I, I like photography, but it didn't include the necessity to know anything. And this was the greatest blight, I feel, of the 60s, uh, which was later to be remedied. I have a, a great fanciful uh, picture of a part of the 60s, which was dominated, as, as we all know, by the, the VW van, the, the great cultural uh, uh, artifact of the 60s. And I can recall very often situations that, uh, in which the van would not work, and my hippie friends would pile out of the commune, not very rapidly, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> languidly, and they'd sort of ooze around the VW van and lament the fact that it wouldn't work. And of course, uh, the first, uh, first approach to this was to say mantras uh, about it, uh, Bremerhaven, Bremerhaven. And uh, that, that didn't work often. Then somebody would suggest blowing some good grass up the exhaust. <laughs> and, and that didn't work. And then the, somebody, a rich person, in the group would drop some of uh, Dr. Owsley's famous blue pills in the gas tank, and that wouldn't work. Nothing would seem to work. And then, rather like the, the great opening scene of 2001, which I think is probably the greatest uh, movie scene ever filmed, you recall the incident uh, where the ape, having created uh, a tool, uh, throws the tool which becomes a spaceship and I, uh, something happened like that with the VW van because out of the uh, place eventually would come a hippie with a book, or, or more accurately, a manual. And the, the person would say, 
I don't know what these mystic runes are, but it says in the book that if you apply the sacred wrench <laughs> to the vital bolts, and if you do adjust the, uh, the holy carburetor, whose karma must be bad at the moment, that eventually things will work. And so the tools were applied to the van, and lo, it did ride upon the street. <laughs> And from that point on, uh, everybody I know became very, very tool-centered, and so they stopped talking to their peonies and uh, <laughs> began reading popular science. And it really got to be a, a terrible thing, uh, actually, because I was overstocked with political science books at that time, having just moved from, from having not worked uh, for 40 years uh, into uh, this creative unemployment. And I had all these political science books, which I wanted to uh, trade very badly for a set of good socket wrenches. And nobody would buy that. <laughs> and I, I kept on trying to trade them for something useful. And finally, when nobody would buy them, we just gave them away. And I just hoped that liberals would pick them up, which would further detach the liberals from tools, which would mean they would never get anything done, and the world would benefit from that. But <laughs> my point is that... Uh, the use of tools is, is, is really critical. It, for the, the person with the airiest uh, and highest uh, social and political theories, it's, it's good to be rooted every now and then into the realization that all the theories, sooner or later, if they're interesting at all, will be applied in a material universe, uh, not a, uh, a, a universe that is simply a, a concept in someone's mind. There will be a there will be a tapping of the pipes, and uh, things will happen at that level. And it's good to be rooted. Thoreau, as you know, was uh, rooted in that sense because he was a pencil maker. That was his family's uh, trade. And he wasn't a hippie pencil maker. I mean, this, you see, this is the idea that you can look like a hippie, live like a hippie, and act like a, a high-energy physicist. In fact, that's probably the best way to do it. So Thoreau uh, made pencils for a living, but he took it very seriously. He studied it. He found ways to speed up the process. He was a small industrialist. And the reason he, he wanted to do a lot of these things, to speed it up, make it better, was so he'd have more time to walk in the woods and do these other things. He did not expect anybody to pay his way uh, into the woods, although Emerson for a time did. But uh, Thoreau was, was not detached only from the state. I mean, he wasn't just uh, angry about that. He was detached from all, really all collectivist activities that would impinge on his individuality. He refused always to join the communal experiments of, of Emerson. Emerson was a, a well-known daffy when it came to that sort of thing. He's always creating uh, new utopian communities, none of which worked uh, at all, worked in the sense of lasting more than a few years. And Thoreau never was part of that. He just, uh, his idea of living in the woods was because he didn't want anybody telling him what to do. He was also, uh, as I pointed out in a recent review of uh, some of the stuff, he was also terrible in the woods. I mean, he was just absolutely, you wouldn't want him around on a camping trip. But he, was, he was great with uh, uh, animals and plants, but he wasn't very careful about fire, for instance. He, he built a fire one time near Walden in the stump of an old and dry log and uh, left it to go observe nature for a time and was uh, aghast when he discovered he'd burned up about 40 acres. Uh, <laughs> <thing. So laughs> and this is very nice because you could turn Thoreau into sort of a, uh, an icon of some sort if you didn't remember that he was a klutz also. <laughs> and so uh, I have never any, any trouble remembering that because there's always Teresa and Jan or Mary Margaret now uh, to remind me of this. Teresa has one great technique which I must mention, you may find it useful. She had thought for a time that uh, when I got carried away speaking to people that uh, she uh, could make some sort of a sign that would uh, dampen my, uh, my ardor and for a time she thought of waving a little yellow flag and that didn't seem to do any good. But so then she discovered that if she sat in the very first row and I started saying something foolish, 
she would just look at me and cross her eyes. <laughs> and of course, this means that in the midst of some really profound but hyperbolic statement, you have to break out laughing. <laughs> and uh, it's worked quite well. So it's good to have these constant reminders. And you must be very wary of anyone who takes ungraciously the reminders that that they, like Thoreau, are a klutz and something. Well, anyway, about skills uh, of, uh, of a practical nature, I think that although not mandatory, it really is very good for people to have portable manual skills, for instance, so that uh, when you decide you can't stand something that you're doing, you can gracefully transit for a time to, to the most ordinary work. Uh, but you probably don't want to, if you're disposed like I am, you probably don't, don't want that to be unskilled labor because that's hard and very dull and very low paid. So uh, some, some good portable skill, uh, the ones that occur to me, welding of course is mine, but, but others that occur to me are uh, pipe fitting, which is a little too complicated for, for most libertarians. <laughs> <laughs> I mean most people. But there are many other things. Now, house painting. This is an extraordinary uh, low skill, a high, high, uh, high demand item. And equipment is, is relatively cheap. But you just have to be careful. In other words, the difference between a good house painter and a bad house painter is simply that the bad ones are sloppy. They're intellectually lazy. Uh, they just don't understand the, the most elementary uh, uh, principles involved, and they usually buy very uh, cheap equipment. Now, a, a libertarian house painter will obviously be brilliant. Uh, I, I don't mean that facetiously at all. The, everybody in this room must understand that they are among the most intelligent people on the face of the earth. That's a, it's sort of uh, a terrible comment on the face of the earth. <laughs> nonetheless true. I see there's an exception. Here's somebody who actually liked to raise her head. Out. <laughs> <laughs> I will that there's several litmus tests. Uh, <laughs> that's got to be one. I mean, I, I've been gilded about a racer head enough. You know, I, I, for a time I thought it was me. You know, but then I've decided, uh, uh no, no, that's not me. That's not me. But anyway, I'm sure you'll explain it to me later. God, what a cult. Uh, <laughs> but at any rate, there, there's that. The, the fact that a very intelligent person can do quite well with these, uh, these, 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 these ordinary skills. Uh, Andre can drive a tractor. He doesn't want to, but the fact of the matter is he can, and he probably would drive it better than 99% of the people currently driving because he's 99% smarter uh, than all of these people. You are stuck with the fact that you're a part of an intellectual elite and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. <laughs> there's one thing you can do about it though and that is to not, uh, is to not flaunt it excessively. Use it, don't flaunt it. The fact is you're very intelligent and so you should act intelligently to your own self-benefit. And my notion is that these portable skills are a sort of insurance policy uh, for people and that it's not bad to have one. Well, that's, that's one kind of skill. The skill that uh, probably is most prevalent in this room is simply logic. That is the most useful skill, I believe, that, uh, that there is, which is why I'm very high on the idea that early childhood education should consist of, uh, just as the med medieval trivium did, uh, should consist of absolutely nothing but logic and grammar and rhetoric. And the children at a very early age exposed uh, uh, and encouraged to participate in these things will later on be able to do anything else. I mean, to, to, to teach a fact to a child is to cripple a child's mind. But to teach them to, uh, to observe and to be critically analytical, uh, philosophically uh, inquiring is, uh, is to give them uh, a gift which will enable them to do anything else. The old uh, uh, saying about teaching 
giving a person a fish uh, ends their hunger for a day, but teaching them to fish uh, ends it forever is quite true. And uh, in, in this world, uh, the fishing is done best uh, by uh, analytical inquiry and by logic. And so that's our greatest tool beyond any question and the greatest skill. And we should practice it constantly uh, in our own lives and our own relationships. Well, that brings us to relationships, which brings us to this afternoon, so I can't really get into that now. But uh, it also I, I, it reminds me of so many things as I go along. Uh, in fact, there was something I meant to mention that it reminded me of just a moment ago. was that? Damn, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the skills, the, the most portable skill that I've thought of, but it's a little hard to acquire, is probably that of medical doctor. It is clearly the most uh, portable skill that there is, but it really is cumbersome uh, to, to gain it. But if, uh, if, if you just had uh, an option and you wanted something to support your, your every activity uh, and you could invest the time, it's clear that that would, be, uh, would probably be the hottest item. Emergency room physicians today are very probably the most free people uh, on the face of the earth. They, they work when they want to. They're very highly paid. And I've noticed that most, uh, most uh, scuba divers these days, most rock climbers, uh, people who, who spend a good deal of time doing these sorts of things are emergency room physicians. And uh, it's really marvelous to see uh, some of the ingenious uh, uh, social inventions that they have. For instance, there is a society for, for the study of underwater medicine, uh, which meets uh, quite regularly uh, at nice places, uh, the Cayman Islands and other such places. And of course, the only way really to immerse yourself, <laughs> so to speak, in the subject is to, <laughs> is to get your tanks on and, and go out and play in the water. And, uh, and our government, of course, has decided that it is good to encourage medical research so it's all tax free <laughs> so so that's a great portable skill uh, on the other hand uh, uh, you can more quickly acquire the skill of nursing which is uh, finally open to to men uh, at last now that the barriers of discrimination against men are beginning to fall <laughs> although much too slowly <laughs> uh, that's not a bad one and it just goes on it goes on down the line there are all sorts of things that you may not do uh, and may not be your chief interest in life, but will enable you to do these other things. The best skill, I suppose, of all is to have a hobby uh, that can be, uh, become a highly profitable activity. Uh, to, to work at anything other than your hobby is a, is a compromise anyway. Your hobby should be uh, your work. And if, if your hobby happens to uh, be able to support you, that's the nicest of all things. But short of that, fallback skills, I think, are important. There's another thing about these manual skills, uh, too. It does keep you, uh, it keeps you in touch. Uh, I know that when I started work as, as a commercial welder, fresh from having worked at the White House and places like that, I, I was curious as to what, uh, what the culture would be like. And I soon discovered uh, the first work I did was in a heavy equipment yard. And I soon discovered, my God, the conversations are better. You know, uh, much, much better, because in Congress, uh, I'm sure it won't disillusion you to know that the, the major subject of conversation are dirty jokes. Uh, I mean, that's the, the major thing that congressmen do, is they, they tell each other dirty jokes. Uh, and and I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of... Uh, of that often when I, I, I know that I now go years with, I uh, hear one or two a year, I used to be 10 a day. And so when I got into this heavy equipment yard, I discovered people were talking about things of great interest. Uh, they'd talk about honor, courage, uh, love, uh, but the language was not delicate. And uh, it, it wasn't sweet language, uh, but uh, it was the same, it was the subject. The subject was, was exactly the, the classical subjects of, of concern. And it really was wonderful to hear this and to know that, uh, that ordinary people all over, at least in this country, uh, are concerned by uh, things that are sometimes considered to be silly, and they're not. They're, they're, 
they're concerned by greatly interesting things, but they have poor language. Or so you must get beyond the language. That's another skill, is to, is to be multi-multilingual. Uh, not in the sense of, of Spanish and, and Italian so much as in the sense of, of what ordinary people mean when they say ordinary things. They may be talking about what, what you call epistemology. They may be uh, talking about the same thing, but in some other way. And uh, so I think that, that's a good skill uh, to have. Good thing to remember, too, about people, because although I think it is quite clear that, that all of you, uh, all of the people I've met in the Libertarian Party are extraordinarily intelligent, this doesn't necessarily mean that they're very sensible or that, uh, that they have the capacity of, uh, of hearing what other people say. I mean, the higher, you, could, you begin to assume, uh, as you either grow older or smarter, that uh, everybody knows what you know. And I've become really sharply uh, aware of how false this is. Mention Pearl Harbor to a, a, a group of uh, college undergraduates these days, and they're likely to wonder, is the surf particularly good there? <laughs> uh, they don't know what the hell you're talking about. If Vietnam doesn't, uh, you know, it's sort of a vague memory. And Barry Goldwater is totally, it, it's, it's, you might as well be talking about uh, Charlemagne or something. It's just gone. All of this is gone. And this is something I think we, we need to remember, that the, the, the world, like our skin, uh, renews itself constantly, and it never comes back. You can pine for it, weep and wail, think everybody should. That's a great libertarian assumption. Everybody should do this, and everybody should do that. They don't. They don't remember, they don't give a damn. It's gone. It's gone. I mean, the, the, this business about having to repeat history is not true. History is never really repeated. Some mistakes are repeated. It's all gone. It's all gone. And here we are brand new. And so to not listen, you, you, there, there's a notion, my God, oh, why don't these kids listen to Bach? Well, they are listening to Bach. Only Bach is now somebody else playing some other music. Uh, Bach's gone. That's a memory now. You love it, I love it, but it's gone. You preserve it in museums and in memories now, but uh, you have to listen to, uh, to the modern versions of it. If Bach lived today, he'd have a synthesizing. He would be working on it. He would be composing for groups with uh, crazy names uh, and, and composing odd and peculiar music. So we need to attend to that, too. The skill, I suppose, there is simply the skill of tolerance and of understanding that no matter what era or bias we come out of, it is possible that for the rest of the world, for most of the world, hi, that it's, it's, all, uh, it's all gone. It's all gone. It's the loneliest feeling in the world sometimes to, uh, to stand on your particular edge of history and understand that you, you have several, you have choices. You can either look ahead uh, into all of this unknown, tumultuous tomorrow, or you can look backwards and, uh, and wish to recreate it. And it can't be recreated. It's all gone. It's all gone. It's all memories. I mean, I, I've, 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 I've lately thought to my horror, my absolute horror, that I will probably know and, and, and work with and, and really love people who will never have read Shakespeare. And then I've thought to myself, that's not a tragedy, because after all, uh, there are a lot of things I haven't read. And, and would that mean uh, Thoreau read uh, Greek, Chinese, Hebrew, various languages? And I suppose he would be disappointed that uh, if he met me that I didn't read Greek and Hebrew and Chinese and so forth. But I think we could get along rather well together because he would understand maybe that's all gone too. The time when that was so essential. Uh, I just think we have to, uh, we have to, we have to give up so much in order to gain so much. And it's so sad, it's so sad uh, to think about these things, but then you realize hell. Well, you get right down to it. may be sad that nobody will read Shakespeare anymore, but there's other stuff. 
five weeks ago, five, about five or six weeks ago, what were people talking about? Superconductivity in the, in the range almost of absolute zero. Today's newspaper has it up to 54 degrees below a freezing Fahrenheit. That is a, a change so rapid and so significant that all of the nostalgia and the pain of change should just wash away from us instantly because everything that is new is going to happen so rapidly and so excitingly that there just won't be much, too much time for nostalgia. I think although there, there, there will be societies devoted to it, like the Society for Creative Anachronism, there probably will be a society for creative mourning of the passing of a common culture and that sort of thing. But you know, when you get right down to it, isn't the mourning of a common culture uh, really an extension of, um, um, of a mourning for the public good? What is this common culture business? I mean, what, why do we have to have all of these odd things to bind us together? We've got this one thing that binds us together above everything else, and that's this, this incredible intellectual capacity that human beings have. That should be enough. That's our common, our common culture is to not have common cultures because each of us can create a culture. Each of us is the center and seed of a culture. And this, this could bind us together. It binds us together in a way because we understand that we're not bison and we're not uh, uh, chipmunks, my, my favorite alternative animal. That although we live with them and among them, we are, are different from them. And so we do have that common culture. And I guess we can, we can muddle through on that. I think I, I try to do that. Well, now, what other skills? Hell, I don't know. Uh, everybody has to, I mean, why, why in the world would you listen to me about this? Uh, anyway, uh, skills are very personal things. I guess the, the, the only thing I could make as a dogmatic statement is you ought to have some. I mean, if you, have, if, if you merely have opinions in your life and not skills of some sort, uh, all the rest of us are going to have to uh, chip in and take care of you, which is okay because you're probably cuddly and very nice. But on the other hand, it, it's nice to, uh, to get out and do something sometimes, so skills are important. Well, that's a short uh, statement, which is probably merciful. I'm, this afternoon's subject, which is our, our ending uh, uh, <laughs> a diatribe, is about love, and that's really important. Uh, skills are very practical, but love is, uh, is crucial, and so this afternoon uh, I'll probably be uh, more enthusiastic. And, and now, as usual, if there are any comments about anything, you understand that the subject is not limited to anything I've said. So, anybody got any uh, questions or comments? Yeah. You were talking about your basic skills mm -hmm. that you should teach a child. Mm -hmm. What happens when you don't give Do you automatically assume that they're going to be able to apply their logic mm -hmm. in any given situation? Because oh, sure. you have a lot of people who do have quote-unquote logic mm -hmm. that they have learned, but they do not know how to apply it. How can that be? Well, I, my example is would be many of these philosophers that you meet in universities. Well, she talks about if, if you if you have uh, practiced logic or studied it, how is it automatic that you would know how to apply it? And she is mentioning philosophers who know it but don't apply it. That's a good example. I mean, God knows everybody here has had a philosophy teacher who claimed to know logic. Uh huh. And they yeah, but, apply it. Well, I suppose they hadn't had any reason to. I mean, you've got to have some reason to, and these people are, would characteristically be sheltered in, in a tenured position. They have no problems to solve. And, and the only application of, of uh, or an application of, of logic that is absolutely normal and natural is to solve a problem. And they have none, except you. <laughs> and they can solve you by just telling you to shut up. So uh, uh, I think you've just described, but a child is different. For instance, a child uh, who has been encouraged in these early, uh, these early years to, uh, to think, to, to uh, practice logical uh, observation and critical inquiry applies it constantly. Because you say, you should not do this, and they say, why not? And then you say this, well, I'll give you an example. I was teaching logic. At, 
a, a bunch of little kids. Uh, I can never remember the ages of kids, but their sizes seem to be about <laughs> like that. And uh, at the time, it was my fancy to wear a very large Western hat. I, I liked it. it uh, uh, I just wore it. I'm a whimsy, you know, I'm a, a Western hat whimsy worshiper. Probably one of the most evil things you could be, but uh, I had this thing on while I was teaching these kids, and uh, this is a girl, and I tell you this, I, I am not, uh, I don't mean to be a traitor to my sex by simply observing that the, the most intelligent questions I've ever had from children have come from, from little women, and that little men <laughs> are very uh, exciting and very uh, active, but uh, they, they, do, they do prefer to fight. <laughs> and so this, this young, uh, this little person, female person, said, why are you wearing your hat? And I said, oh, I don't know, I just like it. She said, well, you shouldn't wear your hat inside. I said, here we have been for some time now discussing a, a logical approach to things, and you tell me I shouldn't? I mean, what extraordinary power has been conferred upon you? You're smaller than I am, dumber than I am. I can beat the shit out of you any, any given moment. And you tell me that I shouldn't be wearing, shouldn't be wearing this hat? Uh, don't tell me that. Tell me why. Well, she wasn't really crushed. Uh, she thought for a moment. She said. Uh, why do people ordinarily wear hats? And I swear to God, that's about the way she put it. And I said, well, to keep their heads warm. She said, uh, is it warm in here? <laughs> you know, so I thought, God, the reason I wore the hat really was so I could take it off to her. And, uh, and so my observation is that, that if people apply it when there's a call to, in another class of such kids, there was a, a, a little logic problem, one of, probably one of Lewis Carroll's, which are some of the most delightful. And in order to solve it, little girl, again, oh God, uh, got up and went to the blackboard and invented right in front of our eyes a sort of rudimentary form of algebra uh, to solve it. Now, good God, I mean, here's this, a rural West Virginia kid and this is the summertime, and they're studying it. We didn't call it logic, just called it thinking. And here, all of this summer, they're going to be doing stuff like that. And in the winter or fall, they'll go back to a place where these kids will say things like, why? And the teacher will say, we're not to that yet. <laughs> and all of that. And, and the execution of young minds will proceed day by day by day in these fact-filled authoritarian go uh, government schools. And I tell you, there is no, uh, if, there's, if there needs to be an underground railway in the entire universe, it's the one here, uh, to get kids away from this and to encourage them to think, encourage them to be human beings, which they are clearly, uh, even though uh, they don't throw balls well at that age. And they have other uh, interesting human attributes, and uh, they can use them. So I think it's, yes, I don't think anybody fails to apply it if they have a reason to. Philosophy professors simply don't have a reason to because philosophy has become sequestered. Uh, people think of philosophy as a useless uh, enterprise when, in fact, I have th thought about this often, uh, that the only reason to go to a university would be to, go to, to enroll in a philosophy class. What? other thing is there that a university teaches that is of any interest or would give you any opportunities. I mean, engineering, hell, every university engineering department in the world is obsolete. I mean, the professors are, are, are working with yesterday's materials, not tomorrow. And so there, there are these, there are so many things that the university can't do. The one thing they could do is let you sit in a class with somebody else and argue. And uh, that, of course, uh, philosophy has ceased to be that, so, hmm, yeah. You're talking about the skills of liberty, and, and I think it's clear that one of the skills for free people is self-reliance. Mm -hmm. And with the paternalistic government, 
people consistently lose that self-reliance, and then it's used as a justification for yet another program because it's clear that people can't deal with the situation. Yeah. Can you uh, ramble on as you do so well on, on that particular? <laughs> You're correct. <laughs> well, now, wait a minute. <laughs> Someday I'll have the nerve to actually say something smart-ass like that and follow through on it. <laughs> I can't resist. You know, the, the greatest thing of that sort that was ever done, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, who had a pretty high manual skill, uh, was given the Philadelphia Society of Architectures annual award. And uh, as is often the case at these award ceremonies, 15 people spoke about him, and when he finally got up, uh, everybody was half dead, and he got up, and he said, my address is Taliesin West, and he sat down. <laughs> <laughs> and I've often thought, God, I'd like to have the intestinal fortitude to do that, but I can't resist running off. <laughs> so, that's one of the, the important things about the Libertarian Party, is to, is to, is to fight that kind of thing. I mean, to simply, uh, uh, to fight it on the basis of, of their stated principles, but understanding that <laughs> if there is a, such a thing as a public good, uh, part of the public good is in destroying the systematic erosion of the public's capacity to be self, or members of the public, capacity to be self-reliant. Of course, this is a, and it's so obvious in rural areas where you, you understand that there isn't much sense in having a neighbor who can't do anything. That the purpose in having neighbors, <laughs> yeah, it may not be the purpose, but the joy in having neighbors is that everybody is self-reliant. You say, well, that means they don't need any help, eh? Not true at all. Occasionally there are events that overwhelm people. And so they do need help. But they can get help from people who know how to do it. Uh, through the practice of charity and the application of skills. Now, I don't suppose it would be a popular political flat platform to oppose welfare programs on the basis of the fact that they're bad for people because the people who enjoy them are not going to believe it, and uh, so on. So you have problems there. So most of politics involves, uh, I think, the unfortunate uh, necessity of making arguments uh, on a, a lower level than you might like. And so you have to approach these things in some some practical way and, and involving budgets and that kind of thing. But uh, I don't know what the alternative is to this, but you're absolutely correct. The erosion of self-reliance in this country is, uh, uh, is probably a large, in large measure, an explanation of, of many of the grave economic problems that big politicians talk about. And yet, the, and, and, and they look out and they don't see people being made incompetent. And uh, where are they being made incompetent mainly? In government schools. I mean, this attitude that you even you mentioned is taught. It's not a natural thing. Uh, I don't think it's, it doesn't spring to the, uh, the untutored mind. Uh, you have to be taught that you're incompetent, incapable, uh, that you can do nothing, but that something else, some institution which apparently is not staffed with human beings can do it. So again, I just uh, commend to your attention the, the first battle line being in the schools. Yeah. Can you give us any uh, tips or guidelines on how we can barter our skills with like-minded individuals mm -hmm. without being shaken down by the government in the process? Yeah, the, the government's attempt to tax barter is probably the most uh, useless and failed of their many harebrained ideas. I mean, because it really depends on the fact that you sort of go to an office somewhere and, and tell them something that nobody else knows about. <laughs> Which immediately calls to mind. One time, Therese and I were arrested uh, together. Uh, the family that uh, goes to the slammer together stays together. <laughs> and uh, Therese has one great character defect. Uh, when she lies, she falls down. It's like it's a version of Pinocchio's nose. <laughs> and so uh, we had been carefully tutored before the, uh, the predictable arrest in this particular caper that it would be wise to put a hundred dollar bill in, in your shoe so you'd have a little uh, walking around money in jail. And so she had a hundred dollars in her shoe 
And uh, they searched her and they asked her questions and all that, to which she answered truthfully every time. And then finally, this damn sadistic matron uh, said, uh, now do you have anything else on you? And so she said, yes, I've got $100 in my shoe. And all the other women who'd been arrested at the time booed and hissed and uh, so forth. But that's, <laughs> this, this, this barter thing is like that. They expect everybody to be like Therese. And, uh, and that's not true because I, I tell you, I have very little uh, hesitation about lying to, to government agents. Uh, or at least not, not telling them that. Not volunteering the, 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 the thing. So, so in this barter thing, there, there's a thing on the tax form where you have to declare it. My God, this would be, this is like uh, committing suicide of some sort. The fact of the matter is, if you do it, it's okay. And what you need to do is to find somebody who needs something and then uh, uh, figure out whether you can supply it. It's as simple as that. And you can find the most extraordinary uh, barters. I've, uh, I welded up a dentist's radiator. I had two years free dental care uh, out of that. Unfortunately, he got a good car after that. Now, now he expects payment. It's, uh, it's really awkward, but I'm the best barter. I must tell you about the best one. Uh, Therese is one of the best graphic artists I've ever known and, and the best editor I've ever worked with in my entire life. And there was a politician in the area who wanted her to design some brochures for him, and she did, and in return, she got a truckload of horse manure. And I figured that designing... <laughs> this was the most appropriate piece of book. Uh -huh. It shows you how <laughs> it works out so well. <laughs> so I, if that's it, you just, uh, you just do it. Just do it. And the chance of, of the state uh, discovering what you're up to is just absolutely re remote. And how, how do you have, I mean, there are economists in here, how do you figure out the value of a, of a, of a barter transaction? It's a zero, uh, a zero transaction, I think. That is, say, you value your service at $100. The person values their load of horse manure at $100. You have $100 worth of, uh, of income, they have $100 worth of income, but it costs each of you $100 to produce it. Your expenses are $100, so I presume that the, the deal is canceled out. Barter is, is, is the most wonderfully useful thing. And people who think that barter is confined to a, a just a few turnips here and there are, of course, incorrect. There's tremendous industrial bartering that goes on in this country. Uh, six, uh, six big lathes for 110 uh, smaller millers and that kind of thing it goes on constantly. And I think it's something that libertarians should, uh, in their personal lives. See, th this is the separation. All members of the Libertarian Party are also libertarians. Libertarians also are people, individual human beings. They have these, these things. And as an individual human being, it is to your benefit to discover as many ways as possible to barter for things. And it just is, it's a research project, that's all. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes time, not lack of skill, seems to be a problem. You sure. achieve so much problem so effectively. Can you tell us how you handle the problem of time and seeing uh, lack of Yeah, well, one way uh, involves something that I mentioned the other day. I think in order to have the luxury of, of using time as you wish, you either have to be incredibly, very rich which I, I consider a decent alternative, or, as I've also said, creatively poor. Now, creative poverty in this sense means that you live as though you are rich, but you do not, uh, you know, you, have, you don't spend that much time on, on, the, uh, on the rich problem. Uh, this means that you probably, uh, there's a whole bunch of psychological things that are involved here, and I understand that it is almost heretical to talk about matters psychological in a party so ruthlessly uh, intellectual and, and logical as the libertarian, but nonetheless, there, there are such things that, that happen. And so you take a, a person who's, whose personality is attached to the ownership of certain things is not likely to have much freedom of time or anything else because they will have to spend so much of their time uh, defending what they consider to be their personality, i.e. their Mercedes.
so there's, there's a, a considerable amount of virtue, I felt, for libertarians, and, but only for libertarians who opt for it, in the, in the Buddhist attitude of uh, disinvestment of these things. In other words, the less, the less things you own, the less things own you. It's one approach. Exactly the same freedom, however, can be obtained by being rich enough uh, to move uh, uh, easily. I would recommend to anybody, I mean, first of all, the, 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 the concept of un, unencumbering yourself, the Thoreauvian uh, method, is something to consider. The other is Doug Casey's book, The International Man, uh, in which he opts for high wealth and high mobility. They're the same, roughly the same thing. I mean, I, Doug Casey is one of my closest friends in all this world. He is very rich, and really quite incredibly rich uh, for such a young fellow. And I'm uh, technically poor, very poor. I have no bank account or anything of that sort. We think exactly alike and we live exactly alike. Exactly. So I think it's, it's really up to you that you, man, you manage to acquire time to the degree that you disencumber yourself from anything that will take up that time. I mean, you, you, you might even have the choice. Would it gain you more time to work eight hours a day in a safe way bagging groceries? You start it and you finish it. You've got enough to live on and you go be a philosopher. Would those eight hours be a better uh, investment or would you be better working, say, for IBM, where you aren't going to work eight hours a day. You have to worry about the boss. You'll be ulcerous and so forth. Maybe the grocery store is a better investment to give you the time. You have to tailor these things exactly to your, your project uh, in life, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder if you'd address what I consider to be the number one problem that libertarians face, as you point out. We operate uh, to a greater extent in the area of intellect and logic. Mm -hmm. However, we're involved in politics, and, and politics is persuading people to to adopt your philosophy. And well, that, by and large, the most is that true? Well, <laughs> that's how I say it. That, that, that we're, are, we're appealing to people to uh, adopt our our ideas of how people ought to get to get along. Well, I can give you a simple interruption there. Uh, you won't get elected. Now, see, I, I mean, I think you need to examine this this thing of what you're involved in. Now, if you're involved in this philosophical thing, that's one thing. But if you're involved in politics, I hate to remind you that you're involved in a, a very simple, dirty business, getting votes. Well, that's what, I, but that's what I was getting to, is that we need to persuade people to at least agree with us to the point that they will vote for us. Now, the the problem is that by, by far the majority of people don't respond to intellect and logic, they respond to emotion. Mm -hmm. It's self-interest. Right. And there's nothing ignoble about, uh, about appealing to that. I think Andre mentioned that the other day when he, he said people vote from their belly. I mean, so if you're telling them that they should do it because it's moral, and somebody else is telling them they should do it because they will derive benefit from it, I don't suppose you have to be a, take a Gallup poll to understand who's going to win the election. Mm -hmm. You know who's going to win the election. And so it occurs to me that the, the ordeal of the Libertarian Party is to make an appeal for votes based on self-interest, the sort of self-interest that works, in a way that will not violate Libertarian uh, principles. But it do, I don't believe it means that every single appeal for votes has to include appended to it uh, uh, every detail of the principles. See, so you, you're just, the Libertarian Party has simply got to face the fact that it's not the Libertarian movement. What you're talking about is the Libertarian movement, in which you all are involved also. In the Libertarian movement, there is an emphasis on philosophy. It is an intellectual movement. There's no question about that. And it approaches these things. It writes those books. It makes those uh, statements. The Libertarian Party, a tiny part of the Libertarian movement, but I'm convinced an essential part, is involved in the day-by-day -day practical defense of individual freedom against legislators. 
uh, this means that they must have countervailing positions. It means that somebody's got to get elected. Uh, and that every time you fail to elect someone, you fail uh, in that mission. Doesn't mean that the philosophy fails. The, uh, the Libertarian Party might never elect another human being. It may go out of existence. Doesn't mean that libertarianism will. And it would be, uh, it would be terrible if, if it would be terrible if the libertarian movement felt that the libertarian party was so bad that there were, as there are a few people in the libertarian movement who keep attacking the party. That's terrible. It would be just as terrible if people in the libertarian party attacked everybody outside of it for not being in it, and so forth and so on. I mean, the fact of the matter is, Russell Means is, is, is yesterday, I think, said the most, the most prescient thing that that I've, I've heard so far here, that it is a whole, it is a whole to take any part out of it, is to destroy the wholeness. The party is this finger, and the philosophers are this finger, and, and the activists are this, and the inventors and the industrialists, and all of these people together form the libertarian movement, which itself is important and significant because it has all of these fingers in it. And you are involved in, in one of those things, and you should be involved in as many other things as you can. To be so single-minded that you think this is the only uh, way to do it. Or as, uh, as some of our, our comrades do, they think their particular project is the only way to liberty, and if people do not join them, they hate them. So they're, they're wasting time, too. They're, they're, they're a single finger. <laughs> and uh, so that, that's, that, I think, is, is when we're here, we're trying to get people elected. I hope. Uh, is that it? Uh, <laughs>